Gio and I are here with a very special uh, guest today. David Kinnaird is the Chief Customer Officer at Ascensus, and we'll let David talk a little bit more about that role and what it means. David, my some of my fondest memories are of you, um, let's see, in the pool in 2016, chasing after your oh, phone. Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. must, you must <laughs> remember that and then so to, and then and then you djing the the best gwa party i would maybe say we've ever had <clears throat> well that was like the you, after you, party or the next make, night party yeah it wasn't up, the formal built, that's that's a that's a significant build up i think you make me sound a lot more exciting than i really am perhaps that was my high point jamie that was it that 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 night in la that was, was it, it. So, did you did you I'm, pack I'm up the dj equipment I'm, I'm glad you were there for it. Um, no, no, I still have it. Okay. Uh, uh, it. It gets broken out for like my kids' major birthday. So my my daughter's 16th and my son's 16th, you know, I end up doing like uh, a one hour dad set, uh, which the kids quite like, right? It's, it's kind of retro. So they like all that stuff. I remember at that LA, when I, after I dropped my phone in the pool, when I went to a reception with my, you know, my wet phone, they immediately reached from behind the counter and produced a bag of rice. Like they had bags of rice lined up just for people like me. So I, it was quite, <laughs> um, I was just following a well-trodden path of stupid old men that throw their phone in the pool. Um, uh, yeah, that was, what was that? That was GWA. It was 2016 and it was at the Four yeah. Seasons. And I also remember the bag of rice because I remember whoever pushed you into the pool or chased you My into, the, I can't, I can't, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Okay. And then I just remember somebody's like, rice, we need rice. And yeah, they, I, they produce it immediately. I, I, I recall actually that, that you, I think that you guys had actually booked that suite in the, um, the hotel. And so the suite, but the suite was not had occupied. had an extra so we, suite. That's right. Which was part of the package. So we, and, <laughs> we negotiated it off of you and, and got yes. it for the night and then had a, and had a party. And, and I, there were people, we had security guards come up and saying, you're making too much noise. And it was like, and I, I'm a Brit, right? So I just presumed that you could do what you liked in, in LA. And so they kind of let us do it, uh, although they, they made like a desultory attempt to close it down, but they didn't really. Uh, I've it's got some Vegas, great photos. Vegas, of one, baby, whatever uh, happens yeah, in exactly, Vegas. All that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was my first, first and last time there. I've never managed to get back, but yeah, it was a good, it was a good experience. So yeah, thanks, Jamie. You, I guess you organized that. I was just a passenger on the no, whole No, I thank you because that, that was still <laughs> like when I, you know, the, the industry, to your point, around right around that time was really kind of adjusting from serviced office to, you know, sort of a different format. Um, I'm not sure I was 100%, you know, cheered in with, with uh, welcome arms as like a co working background person. So um, your antics uh, at the conference distracted everyone. And I have great memories of that event. We did. Um, I think it's uh conferences are you know they they at my view at conferences it's it's about meeting people and uh, yeah. talking to people and and so you know the booze everyone gets very obsessed about the booze and the design of the booze and you know kind of the materials and what have you and um certainly our view when i was in the states was that the whole point of a conference was just to you know uh get to know people personally and you know not and actually um not with any sort of um feeling that 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 personal stuff leaves the business but you know it, actually inevitably it does but actually there's no point being in the industry unless you can create strong relationships with people and um whether that was through um you know obviously we, we obviously joined you know martin sen and i'm sorry i don't want this whole podcast to be re us reminiscing about stuff but you know the guys at da vinci uh were very strong at, at creating cultivating those 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 personal links and they brought people together and when you come together whether socially then naturally you talk business and you learn yeah. stuff and you share things and you share experiences and you know that's kind of you know that's really what the GWA was for so we were very focused on not having booths although we you know naturally we had to have one but it was more about uh, okay how can we get people out in social settings where we can talk to each other um at Juicy we I, and I, of course we went to Juicy also I'm sorry about it but you know we uh we, we love Lizzie Eamon we that, go to Juicy stuff. too no totally of course 100%. Yeah, yeah. I already bought my ticket for Chicago can't so wait we went to we went to uh the LA Juicy uh we uh we went the whole hog there so how our entire booth was a DJ stand with drink, uh, and it just everyone just just, just was around. I remember that time. too because I think <laughs> yeah. I danced to Flash Dance, the Flash Dance go. song with Martin. There you go. There you go. So that's <laughs> See, you're you know, right. That's, Some of the best memories are like. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I love that's it. why I said okay. the, my time in the states was was a, was an amazing time. Yeah. So thank you, Jamie, for that trip down memory lane. That's enough now. <laughs> the glory days. Well, okay. I yeah. mean, I think that's that's a great segue into kind of your background and your bio and kind of what 
what got you into the flex industry and kind of what you do at a census and all that fun stuff. So, <laughs> okay. I, well, uh, you, I guess you have to turn the clock back. I, so initially, Giovanni, I was um, uh, straight out of school. Uh, I, I went to university and failed a degree. And so I then did that. Uh, I, I joined the army, which is uh, kind of a, this is, this is going to be a tough reach to get us into co-working, right? But I joined the army. I joined uh, as an officer in the British army. I ended up doing uh, nearly 15 years. And, um, uh, you know, we got, I, I really enjoyed it. I was doing really well at it. It was, it was definitely a career that I could have stuck with. Um, and there's, there's a whole turn at Sliding Doors career path down there. Uh, but a very good friend of mine said, look, uh, he, he'd left a couple of years before, well, he'd left the army and was working for a company called MWB business exchange uh and um he said there's a job here technical uh you know running the it for him and uh you know this might be this might be the right slot for you to to leave and um uh, and all of those little triggers that i'd had about thinking about leaving uh, all clicked over and i saw this uh, this amazing company and they're a service office company you know very traditional old school um so we, this is like 1998 1999 and they had 50 odd locations in London and the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, and they were expanding to Spain and they were, they were f- amazing funding. And it was just, you know, uh, sexy, glamorous people, great coffee, all the stuff that I didn't have in the army. You know, it was like a complete counterpoint to my experience in the, uh, the UK <laughs> Ministry of Defence, which was dull suits and make your own coffee and disgusting toilets and all that stuff and there was this incredible different life you know and I was seduced by it you know so all of the I just like okay, I'm done I'm done this is done this is this is me and um so I joined MWB as the IT director and and this was this was at the time when in order to create a service office proposition you had to stitch together so many complicated things you know whether it was you know post and franking machines phones fax um ISDN2 no one no one will know what that is, but it's like an old fashioned data line. Um, uh, there was like concierge services and, you know, the internet hadn't really kicked in in terms of providing all the things that people, Amazon wasn't there. So if you wanted to buy stationery, you know, so, and at scale, this became a big, uh, a big operation. So it's quite a lot of people working for MWB and the IT team was huge, like 40 people, you know, 40 IT engineers all wow. delivering that stuff. And setting out, you know, this is because it was across the UK and across France and 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 uh, say Netherlands and Germany and stuff. So, um, but it was kind of this was in the day where you didn't have to recognise your rent free period across the whole of the lease. And so the reason that this company, and I can probably say this now, uh, the reason this company was kind of self sustaining was it was self sustaining through the rent freeze. So by opening more and more centres, uh, it was using the cash flow from the new locations to fund its next ones. And at some point, if you stop opening new locations, then uh, you then start paying rent and, you know, the real business kind of emerges. And so, unfortunately, that happened for me like three months after I joined them. So have left this 15 year glittering military career seduced by, by um, uh, you know, the, the coffee and, and beautiful the, offices. Yeah, beautiful, and... Beautiful, beautiful offices. <laughs> and then the whole thing went, yeah, well, we're going to go bust now. So we're going to sack everyone. And um and so, I, you know, I really thought I'd done, made the worst decision of my life. And, uh, but I, I survived. I guess somehow I, I kind of proved it, survived it. And I spent like four quite brutal years then, like just cutting costs. And I learned a huge amount about the way that, that you know, for an army guy, you don't get much commercial experience at all. So I had to learn the, the kind of the hard way. I then did a couple of years at BT, really weirdly uh, involved in freedom of information legislation as a consultant. Uh, but I don't really know how it happened but I just kind of found this other niche which was fun for a bit and then I then came back I was called up and actually hunted to come and join Avanta Jamie so you'll know uh, David Alberto and um, it was actually one of the pioneers really of, of the whole serviced office game you know he you know he was one of the very early guys behind it and um, there are four locations in London he said look come back you know this is growing fast and sure enough it did and we ended up with 45 offices uh we did india also uh, a couple of acquisitions and um uh and i ended up becoming the uh coo there uh and yeah learned a ton of stuff and we can dive into some of the things uh, there's some interesting stuff particularly about the london market that we, we can talk to and um uh uh and then from there 
IWG acquisition and then the census, which we covered earlier, but I'll just touch that now because it's important is that the, I, I did not want to work for Regis and any people uh, out there who are listening, uh, who work for Regis, you know, I'm, I'm, no offense to you, it's a great company actually. And it's an amazing sales machine. And you know, my, you know what they do across uh, all the continents of the, of the globe is astonishing. But it was not something I wanted to appear on my CV. I didn't, I personally, personal view was I didn't like the way that they treated customers and I didn't want to be part of the uh, IHateRegis.com website and all that stuff. And um, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't a great cultural fit for me. Um, and, and, and as they had acquired Avanta, my, my company, they acquired me. And so I then really just spent time looking for an exit. And um, part of Avanta's growth story had been this very young, dynamic uh, tech company, software company, uh, Census. And I'd shared my vision with its founder, a guy called Mark Finesse. I'd shared with him, um, you know, very early on in my time at Vanta, what I wanted from, from tech. You know, we, we had a, a, an, IS, an ISP and a, and a managed service provider delivering service to us, really messy, you know, to try to get what we wanted. It was difficult, difficult. Everything went wrong all the time. Engineers made mistakes all the time. And I said to Mark, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And so... In he they essentially created this thing, uh, um, and Avanta bought it, and then other people bought it. This this amazing software that that, that orchestrated services for uh, for co-working, and it made uh, Avanta grow. <clears throat> so when when I was at kind of this loose end, what shall I do next? I knew that Census were were heading off to the states, and so uh, I spoke to Mark, and you know uh, he said, "Look, you'd be the perfect fit, uh, despite being a Brit." Uh, we think you should you should go off to America and and uh, see what you can do out there, and you know age just I wasn't quite fifty. It was definitely the right time of life to make a change. I lived in this tiny village in Wiltshire for like fifteen years, and so I took my family. We uprooted, came out. All of us, um, uh, all five of us, came, and the dog came out and lived out here. Just in actually, we lived in Connecticut, uh, but but worked in the city, and had um, you know I just love this country. You know it's. Uh, it is crazy at times, right? There's, there's, there's much about it. I used to tell people about the competing people for, for garbage collection and, and uh, how everyone's got guns in their glove boxes and uh, all that crazy stuff. But um, from, a business, <laughs> from a business perspective, you can't, you know, if you own a Ferrari back in England, someone will scratch it. If you own a Ferrari out here, someone will say, wow, great car, man. That's great. You know, what, you know, what, what did you do to get that? You know, there's a real sense of, of driving people forward and, and and the honesty about business too is that people tell you if they like your stuff and they will buy it within a second of meeting them and if they don't like you they tell you you can go elsewhere so there's there's none of this kind of hoo-ha hum politeness stuff you just know exactly where you stand and um uh and so with the small team you know we, we set about establishing the brand and, and and getting ourselves going and and i think really through just being nice people that's what we set out to do be nice people we were great products uh, and then, um, sadly, I had to leave for personal reasons and stuff. We ended up having to go back to UK. So, uh, I, but I do miss it, Jamie. You know, if you if you can get me out here again, I'll do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I was another say, podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I absolutely love your your background, right? I mean, you come from from a place of servant leadership, right, in the military, which which you have to do as an officer, right, and then yeah. you, you step into you know, a role which you're, you're serving an, a, a new audience, right? And that, that's really what our flex industry is, is about building community and everything else. And even, you know, before we, we really started recording, I mean, we were having conversation about community, right? You and Jamie were trading stories and how y'all got started. I mean, Kurt's part of what, what I call my co-working mafia, you know, <laughs> Ian's awesome. I mean, your, your team overall, I mean, it's, it's all about service and, and giving back. And so I think it's, it's been really great to see the evolution of the census, you know, uh, through good and through bad, right. There's up and downs and, you know, there's the acquisition of, you know, Yardy was acquired. What was. No, no. Um, uh, we, RJ Metis was uh, our acquisition. Oh, so yeah. So we, yeah, we acquired our Metis. So, yeah, yeah, no, but we didn't, uh, yeah, who yeah. acquired, who did Yardy acquire? Yeah, yeah, one systems. One, one systems, day, right? One system. And so when that was acquired, it opened the door for you guys to step in, as I remember, because a lot of people were having issues with that acquisition, right? It was too big. They were focused on different things. So it opened the door for you guys to kind of step in and take a bigger role within the flex sector. Um, I think, yeah, I think um, 
we, we, you know, we had a, obviously at every trade show you bump into the same people and we had a great relationship with uh, with uh, the one guys. Uh, although I did once kick him out of a drinks party. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd funded... We'd funded this this event, and I uh, saw the I saw our, our competitors, you know, drinking my alcohol. So I just stood up and said, "No, you guys, no, it's, you've got to get out of here. <laughs> you know, this is a census, man. You're not 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 uh, not one systems uh, stuff." Um, uh, but I, you know, but I think opportunities and market segments open up for for um, you know, it's a big market, and there's many players offering different things. Yeah, and so we we haven't really focused much on what the opposition do as as if you like focused on what we can do and what we can do best and we have changed some of that as time has gone by uh, and um you know and you some some things you you try and you learn and you come back from but you know that's kind of what and not being not being afraid to take chances and make changes is 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 you know it would have been very simple for us to carry on doing the same thing all the time but i think you know we've tried to really expand what we do and deliver it in a slightly different way uh, and, and a sense has always been a has always done things slightly differently in respect of, of delivering technology to to to, to co working. Yeah, has done it's it's always it's focused on on doing it a different a kind of more in many ways a more ex, slightly more expensive but we think a better way. You know, so because no one else did it in quite the same way, we didn't really need to think about how other people were doing it. Yeah, and that I mean, I sense. think a huge part is y'all have capitalized on opportunity, right? And I think yeah. that's that's kind of where I was trying to head is. So not everyone that's listening is knows exactly what a census does. So you want to kind of share with us kind of the evolution of a census, kind of where it started, kind of the progression and kind of yep. what a big focus is now. I think, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, when we, I, I don't know whether it's before we start recording or after, but we talked about how, how service offices back in, you know, the early days were, having to glue together lots of different things to deliver those services to their members. And, um, and in fact, actually, the, the overall pitch at that time was because we, the service office company, have, have taken the effort to build all these corporate level services together, we can now deliver you, a five, six person um, company, uh, a, a, a enterprise level of internet, phone, postage, um, coffee, uh, insurance Faxes. and all those things yeah whatever you know <laughs> um, and um, you know the kind of the shtick was that that you could not you could not as an individual person or small company get this level of service um, outside of a uh, serviced office company you know just so the name serviced office was was predominantly around the services that went alongside the office um, and particularly then it was um, as you said Jamie fax fax machines i think the last fax was sent last year was i read an article about that you know the very last fax has uh, has finally gone maybe who knows uh, i think the tele- government here still faxes i think that's for sure <laughs> yeah. we i think i think in our nhs they still fax like uh, prescriptions around that right. sort of stuff you know exactly. they they still they still kind of exist um, but you can take you can take it on your phone now just take a photograph anyway um, we digress. So yeah faxes phones uh, internet uh, and like early data lines isdn lines uh, were the, the the meat and drink of of what the service officers were doing, and it was really complicated to deliver because every time somebody moved into an office, you had to like give them all of this fresh stuff, uh, and then when they left, you had to tear it all down. And it was entirely manual, so engineers were doing all this stuff, and it cost a lot of money. And so, where a census came from, what what it set out to do was to build a way of delivering those services in an automated way such that uh, no engineer would be involved, no person would be involved in that process. Um, so to make it as secure as possible, uh, you know, from a, from a physical and digital security uh, perspective, um, uh, to make it as, as fail safe as possible, you know, the whole thing would always be working. And also to make it as, as fail safe in terms of making sure that it was done right first time with no to and fro and back and forth. And the final piece was to put the power of delivering it into the hands of the, the, the team that were running the location. And so uh, they wouldn't be at the beck and call of, of another company. They could sit at their PC and, uh, and uh, d- deliver these complicated services at, at, a, at a key press uh, with a single pane of glass. And so that's where that was the genesis of a, a census uh, as a company delivering services to, to service offices and then to Flex. And it was London, you know, so they, they started off in London, uh, and um, 
you know, you, the, the build out from there, ended up with loads and loads of, of, of customers all over the UK. Um, and then came the, the, the US, still doing the same. So when I joined the census in 2015, that was pretty well what we were doing. Of course, phones were still pretty important, actually, 2015, 2016. Um, I, you know, a lot of the, the New York companies, uh, co-working companies that you'll be familiar with, Jamie, you know, that Nikos is and uh, uh, all the guys at uh, Nikos and um, Hippodrome and, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of phones, it, which seems crazy now when you look into an office now and you just never see them. But they, it was massively important then. And um, they still exist here and there, of course, but it's obviously diminishing. Um, and then uh, we acquired um, uh, HubCreate, which was Justin Harley's company, uh, which was a, a software um, which was designed to, to run um, uh, really from lead to cash, you know, running the, the sales, sales cycle, uh, the license agreement, the, the bookings, uh, uh, the meeting rooms, uh, online portal for, for, for booking that stuff. But it was a completely, at the time, a completely standalone piece of software, which was actually run like old school client server. Um, so we set about turning that into a web, web application and um, pretty successfully grew and grew and grew. We then went for an IPO um, uh, just before, about a year before the pandemic struck. Uh, very successful IPO, uh, gave ourselves uh, you know, great balance sheet to, to operate with. And um, uh, then, then COVID hit. So we had a great year, then COVID came. What are you guys doing COVID, Jane? What did you do in COVID? How did you- What did how, I how do your, during COVID? Yeah, what, what, what did you do to your business? What happened to your business? Oh, so my lease expired in June of 2020, which uh, wow. I thank God for every single day. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah, and well, it, you know, it was you... doubling. But So my lease was doubling. So I was already transition, planning to transition out um, and that was good timing because, Sam, you know, as you know, California in general took COVID very seriously. So yeah. it would have been tough getting people back to the office. It seems it went on for a long time, didn't it? And um, yeah. You, you, but, but, what, but what we saw, and I'm sure most people saw, is that, that um, through this, Flex was going to become, you know, if not the only game in town, was going to be the only place that would be growing uh, after um, and we and we saw in that like there was an opportunity in that, that more and more landlords would be thinking about um, flex, and so we we knew that we could solve for flex, and so um, and we we started to look at how what else landlords might need other than just the technology, like other than just the the connectivity layer, and started to develop um, solutions and services for that too. You know, particularly aimed at you know kind of whole building opportunities, and there's so many kind of there really are now, it's almost impossible to categorize how people are carving space up and marketing it. You know, every day I hear of or see a different way of doing it. And so we felt that, that if a building had a digital backbone uh, powered by our software, we could kind of give the landlord the tools to do anything they wanted to immediately. And, um, and actually the same would apply and again, this is where you start to look at all the different personae involved in our in our uh, little market, in, in, what, in what we do. But there are a lot of different people, um, uh, whether that's, um, um, you know, CBRE or the JLLs of this world, or whether it's um, uh, uh, a one, a one extreme, or whether it's a, an owner, building owner, who wants to be an operator um, of a small building in a suburb at the opposite extreme. And... Um, there are many different ways of cutting the pie around. Obviously, I know you spoke to, to, to Jamie Hadari um, uh, a couple of episodes ago. He, you know, th they've obviously migrated from, from leasing to, to management agreements now. And, and actually, many of their buildings, they're looking at extending what they're doing and, and working, you know, having already having an arrangement with the landlord, they can do more than just the flex. And so, you know, our feeling was that if we were in amongst this mix of all these different people, as long as we could say, look, get your building kind of digital ready, give, put this backbone in, and then whatever you want to do, quickly, you can do it. And, and that's kind of where we've taken the, the business to now. Um, so I'm sitting, I'm sitting here now in uh, Rockefeller, you can see from the screen, Rockefeller Center. This is um, Tishman Spare Studio. Um, and actually, you know, we, we, we've, most of this building and a, a fair bit of the rock, all of rock has got our services in. So I was in Gather, 
I was in Studio Gather earlier, hosting a, a school from Brooklyn with this outreach day today. I mentioned to you before the call. Mm -hmm. We had like 50, um, is it, so there's three years in high school, right? Is it junior high? So the, the bottom right. one. Uh, so they're all 17, 18 years old and there's less 50 of them. And I was trying to explain to them what co-working was <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> I said, it's like kind of Airbnb for, for businesses. Uh, and I think they got it. Actually, one by one person immediately asked how much it was, which was good. I liked him, Harvey. If you're listening, Harvey. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, yes, you know, studio a great example of kind of. So they, they've got obviously Autism and Spare. have got studio as their co-working brand. Uh, they've got Studio Private, which is their um, a, a private ready-built offices up yeah. and down the building. You know, um, and we power all those too. So it means people can move in, move out, uh, uh, and then gather obviously the co-working stuff. And if if anyone here at Rock, who's a who's a a member here walks around and they'll be connected to the same secure wi-fi you know wherever they go and so if you think now if you okay look at some sort of like willis tower you know if you're uh, working in a flex office in will's tower and you head up to the sky lounge you know how great it would be if you pick up your network and you're you're on your same network again you know it's secure you haven't had to log into a guest wi-fi you've just been in the same thing the whole way so um yeah that's i think you asked the question, you know, that, that's kind of what we do. We, we kind of power commercial real estate to, to take advantage of, of flex. By the way, that's not to say that the that, that operators of flex are not in any way out. out you know, we, you know, we still absolutely, we, we're, we've, our roots sit within flex operators, but yeah. we've extended that. We've taken that credibility of working with those guys and said to landlords, look, we've done all this with this. We know flex inside out. If you're now interested in flex, then we can support you and help you on that. And you know, often too, we're often involved in, in conversations about 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 the space and about you know how it's carved up. And but you know, we but, but fundamentally we're not there to be advisors. But you know, because we've been we have many people in this business that have been here a long time. So we we, we you know we we just try to help basically. Is that yeah? Is that no? That's exactly it. I mean, what I love about it, just to kind of continue talking about that, is I mean, ultimately we've been talking about the activation of buildings, right? And yeah, how do you that's that's right. And, yeah, and create synergy from the first floor all the way to the top floor right so traditionally right. the way property management works is every tenant is is in their own silo right they have amenities they're able to to utilize to some extent right a gym a conference center a cafe whatever but really the goal has been how do you activate the entire space with building a community for the entire space not just a co-working space individually as a tenant but how do you offer yoga and you know, breathing. I mean, it, I've heard, I've seen the craziest thing, cooking classes and, you know, just, just the ability. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen a dog wash in a co-working center. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a dog wash. Yeah. That was, uh, that was in, um, I want to say Sheboygan. It wasn't Sheboygan, but it's up near, near Chicago somewhere. Uh, yeah. I uh, love that had, you know Sheboygan. That's hilarious. I, I know Sheboygan <laughs> from, uh, from, uh, from Home Alone. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was Home Alone? No, I think so. Yeah, the part, did they the, talk the, about? Uh, that's hilarious. Uh, uh, Sheboygan, yeah. Uh, is that I have a, yeah, I have a client who's building a, a flex space there. He bought a big building. I just love the word Sheboygan. It's where the poker so poker about John Candy. You know, he would yep. talk about Sheboygan. <laughs> that's why that I know Sheboygan. So funny. Dog wash. That was a dog wash. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're I, right. It's it's it, 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 the, the concept of a of a, an activated building and and for a member to be able to traverse that building not just the flex space but the amenity space and wherever else they might go uh, and still be connected to the building and actually you know this is kind of where you might say well hey we've got 5g now you know we've got 5g and we've got um you know we've got in-building antenna but the point is that that's then provided by some nameless verizon or some nameless sprint mm -hmm. you know and you've lost the connection with the customer you know, A, you don't know where they're going and what they're doing, um, and you can't, you know, we, that's why we think kind of Wi-Fi still has that that key role to play yeah. in buildings, and we'll always have, and we'll always be more reliable than, than 5G. That is it's interesting, a, isn't it? Topic it's for like another a, podcast, that, yeah. It's, yeah. A it's a tool, but it is it is the thing that sort of tra travels it's with your, you at all it's times. Your, so. It's your umbilical call to that. that yeah. That, when when the, the the pandemic hit, the, the the information that people wanted from us about their tenants was um, how many people are in our location, you know, really each day. Um, yep. And unless you've got a, a Wi-Fi system where you've taken, so for example, if you have like a just a open network with a shared key, you simply can't count people 
um, you can you know you can take a rough count of devices. But if if you have a, a network where people are username and password per person, then you exactly yeah. know who was in, when they were in, and you can start to do. So in fact, over the pandemic, you know the the the, the lock, various lockdowns in the UK and the US, you know one of the key metrics that people wanted was, you know, can we see that there's people. Is there, a, is there a tick up? Are we starting to see it coming back? You know, can we start to draw a graph that looks like normal? No one would have expected it was gonna go for two years, right? <laughs> um, but you know, that became, because it's far more accurate than, than swipe cards and, you know, and, and many places didn't have any form of, of monitoring who was actually in their space, particularly when they sent their staff home as well. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, Wi-Fi's got, uh, uh, you know, Wi-Fi's gone from being this, this um, difficult, well, it's still, I'll come back to, to difficulty in deployment, but it's gone from being like a bit niche for used every now and again to the only way that people connect. You know, that's very few people plug in now. So the, the whole Wi-Fi thing has become probably the most critical part of what we do in some ways. Um, I was, I, I did start to talk to this about to, to the, the kids from, from Brooklyn, uh, from the Brooklyn school, um, but for, for many people, you know, the, the journey of, of how stuff gets from your um, phone or your computer out to some other computer on the other side of the planet, you know, across the internet is, is just, you know, it's completely hidden. You know, you know it's, a, it's this incredible um, uh, piece of feat of technology and engineering that, that's, that's just kind of people only see from their phone. And the, even my kids say, you know, Dad, the Wi-Fi is not working. And um, it's actually not the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is still working, but something else in that, that, that chain that, you know, might be, Two and a half thousand mile chain has stopped working. You know, between your phone and that computer, which is serving you that information, something is broken. Now, um, before Wi-Fi, uh, you could pretty well, you know, that, that last bit of the connection from inside the building to your computer was, you know, a piece of Ethernet cable. You could predict, plug that in. You kind of knew it would work. And in fact, the screen I'm talking to you on now, I know it's plugged in because if you, you know, kind of you want it to, to guarantee to work. But, but, but Wi-Fi um, is actually kind of the same as the, the, the cable, but just in the air. So um, there are very few cables available. So if you like, so it operates in channels. So there's only 25 channels of Wi-Fi uh, available to use. And um, some of those get, get taken out because of weather radar and that sort of stuff. Uh, they're, called, they're called the DFS channels. It only leaves like eight channels so it's like having just an eight lane highway uh mm. to drive down and um again you know I take turn the clock back 10 years there wouldn't have been many wi-fi networks but if you go to a big high rise in the middle of manhattan now or or san francisco or, or chicago you know you'll pick up like hundreds of networks and they're all trying to use the same channels the same bit of road so you're driving all of you are trying to drive down the same road at the same time and some people set these channels to, they set it to use all of them at the same time. So, you know, some guy set networks up, this is right, I'm going to just use this setting, which means all the channels get used. <clears throat> so this, this environment's got noisier and noisier and noisier. And, um, you know, we've worked, oh my God, it's just like, it, it, it's the one thing that we are, you know, everything else kind of the back end. Uh, I'm not saying that's a given, but we've worked hard to make that sure that's as clean as possible. But this this new minefield world of Wi-Fi is, is, is where the fights begin. And, um, you know, we've had to work hugely on our standard procedures for mounting the devices, uh, how we do the surveys, what the capacity planning is like, uh, the vendor selection. So you know, I'm quite happy to say that we moved away from Ruckus a couple of years ago because they, they just don't work in an automated way well enough to guarantee service in a noisy environment. And so, you know, you, you, when someone's decided to, to take a rent uh, or take a license and commit $2,000 a month for their office, the last thing they want is the Wi-Fi not to work. And, you know, half the time it's not working, it's because of what someone else is doing in the next building, you know, or the guy in the floor below. Or, and so we, you know, we, we put a huge amount of time and effort into making sure that's as clean as it possibly can be. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the, I think now has become the new... Uh, People used to talk about the last mile, right? It's the important stuff, but it's actually the last 10 yards. Now that's mm. the, the key thing. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it's been, a, a, you know, even today we're, we're, we're dealing with, uh, uh, we discovered like a, 
a treasury company uh, in one of our customers offices that's just blasting at 80 meg you know just just taking out all of us and my customers saying you know this is just this is terrible so well it's we just got to go we've got to phone these guys up so you get on the phone you, you you try to track their it department down you have a conversation with them and say you just got to turn this down you know I, at some stage landlords might end up having a policy that says you know if if you're operating wi-fi in this building uh then you need to these are the parameters upon which you can use it because it's i know many people say if you live in multi-family uh they have a nightmare you know every single apartment has their own wi-fi just knocking next doors out you know yeah what would you do i, I love the the highway analogy because i think it's so hard so easy for um non-technical people to sort of track with that you've got eight, um, eight, it's it's eight lanes at the same time and um, right. it's like having eight separate uh voice conversations at the same time but everyone's voice conversation all being mixed up together and you've got to try and pick that apart to be able to piece it back together yeah it's, a it's really crazy complex thing. and almost impossible for the average so um 80 of leases that get signed are you know under five thousand feet right so you get all these small businesses, smaller companies, or not even big companies who want a small piece of space, you know, in a local office trying to figure this out all on their own. It makes complete sense that, it sh that the building mm. should be, you know, the, sort of the, the one person in charge of just making it work. And to your point, people really expect that today, right? And I think you, I think a sense has published something or um, amplified something where people were saying like sometimes they just go to the office because they need the the tech to work right like yeah. you know for whatever reason at home you know it's 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 not working and so they they need the tech to work at home i'm curious just from a macro perspective because i think your role is so interesting you used to be on the operator side which is kind of micro right you know what you're doing as an operator and now to your you mentioned earlier like you see so many different types of customers and how they're operating what is the um sort of the pace of landlord adjustment and and a sort of adoption of this mindset post covid like tishman's obviously an early adopter what what does the broader market look like in terms of how they're thinking about adding flex and you know being the point person in charge of the like the base experience in the building and the and the connectivity what what would you think, say about that that yeah, yeah that's a, that, that's a that's a great question i think <clears throat> You know, in the same way, even before the pandemic, some landlords had, had sought to dip their toe in, you know, they had seen um, operators who had taken leases or even management agreements, you know, making, uh, you know, good money uh, from this and felt that they should have some of that action as well. Um, but we're not really uh, operationally geared in order to deliver that. Um, and the, the same applies now yeah, where um, the, it, it on paper, it seems relatively straightforward, but until you then, you know, dis dis determine that you actually need people to service this. And so there are some uh, landlords have attempted to try to operate um, a degree of flex within within their buildings, but have continued just to use what was the original property management team to, to do that um, with, you know, varying levels of, of success. Um, because the, the, if you like the hospitality element to take someone that was involved in reception duties and and facilities management and and managing you know and, and collecting service charge information suddenly to make them hospitality people is a is a there's maybe not the right people but equally you know combining the things together to make that into a into a product or proposition is is more difficult than than some would have thought you know i, I think the most successful are where landlords are partnering with existing operators um uh, you know, just noting what Jamie said about his his view of the future, where you know five or six, whatever number, you know, b b operators become globally the 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 lead for this. You know, I, I don't know how far that future is, um, but the you know the ability of a small um, small landlord to do this in a piecemeal fashion or a building by building basis is is probably limited unless they're prepared to you know take that big investment in people and a team to to run that. Um, so the take up of that has been people have tried different ways. You know, I think we're seeing, um, you know, studio have obviously been very successful at it and have put a, put, put a huge amount of effort into, into delivering it. Um, and it's a, and it's a great product and, 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 you know, but they've got great buildings. I think as more and more, if, if, if more and more space remains unlet, 
you know, clearly there would be a demand to try to, to do something, you know, inventive with it. And so, you know, is there a future where, you know, everything is flex? Uh, I'm, if not everything, very, very, very near everything. Um, you know, what was interesting is already in the US, even when we came to the US in 2015, we rented space in a Kaufman building at, um, in 7th Avenue and bought, uh, we rented a ready built, this, this, and, which I think is a New York thing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 square feet, uh, you know, four to 8,000 square feet. It's got a kitchen and yep. uh, you, you pay for a mini, a mini fit out. Yeah, like know, a tech suite. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but no, interesting, no IT, you know, no. Right. So totally. We, even, even we had to wait for like four months for, for a circuit from, from someone. And um, so when we were in there, I went to see uh, Mr. Kaufman in the building. And, you know, I got about 30 seconds of his time and said, look, you know, we're here now. We could get rid of that delay and start and, and get, you know, compress your leasing time and give you, give your customers quicker time to value. And, you know, and he, he, he then in 2015, just, you know, wasn't interested at all. I expect he would bite my, if I should go and see him again now and say, look, you know, it's going to cost twice as much as it did then. Uh, right. <laughs> But it's yeah, fascinating though, right? Such yeah. a pain point for the customer. Yeah. And yet- pain, the, the... And a pain point for us, you know, we couldn't, even we couldn't get it in. Three right? months, I think it was, a, yeah. yeah. So we're yeah. working on a hotspot for three months or not working at all, waiting, you know, working in hotel rooms. You know, it's not, it's not where you want to be at all. Um, I think the other interesting thing is, is I want to pull this from my experience at Avanta, is um, we had a building in, in central London. Uh, in fact, most of our buildings were in central London, but one in particular in the city at uh, Austin Friars, so right in the heart of the city of London, which is the financial district. And it was a, it was a 55,000 square feet building. And as we were fitting it out, we were approached by uh, one of the brokers with a view to letting two floors directly to, to Deutsche Bank. And so, you know, it's a great deal, obviously. And for those, anyone that's been in this business knows that you think, you immediately think, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to get my building full immediately. But then you think forward to two years when you've got this massive void uh, that you've then got to fill later. And um, but we did we did the deal anyway. But part of that deal process was, uh, you know, they're very, very uh, um, demanding client. They want to know floor loadings, uh, what the HVAC system could do, uh, you know, what temperatures were would be you know, permissible within the building. You know, huge amount of effort on the IT and, uh, you know, whether... Deutsche Bank, we're going to use the IT services from this company. In our van, you know, you know. Anyway, having been through that process, you know, it, it became pretty clear to me that if you're operating space, particularly somewhere like Central London, then you need to pitch your services at the highest level you can. Now, if they end up being used by a one-man band, he's lucky day. But if you want to attract the corporate clients, then you need to have at your fingertips all of the information that they need to to help them make that decision. So they're going to ask you what's the volatile composition of your carpet you know they're going to ask you they want to know about their light bulbs they want to know about your we and your electronic disposal regime they want to know how much floor loading you do they want to know how often does the air get changed they want to know when do you do your fire drills and so at the time certainly at that time many serviced office companies just didn't have that information you know they would just so we you know we at about to build a book out for every building you know so here's the you're going to buy space from us Here's kind of the, the, here's the building information that you can tick off and know about. And so when it comes to, to, to technology, you know, a census view is that if, you know, if we can make, if we can prove to any customer that this is as good or better than they could ever deliver themselves, even for a bank. So, you know, to get ISO 9001, ISO 27001, SOC 2 for the US, um, you know, so now it becomes, right, well, tick, 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 you know, let's, there's no problem. And so, as your doors open of your co-working space, anyone that wants to come in should be able to access. You know, there's no, there's no barrier. A, a lot of enterprise IT guys don't want, they, they just want to do the same thing as they did in all their other offices. So they go, no, 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 we're not using your stuff. We're gonna, you know, so we've had so many conversations with um, our customers, customers, IT teams who are very reluctant to believe that anyone else can be as good as them. You know, but 10 minutes into the chat and they go, oh, okay, that's simple. Yeah, we'll do that. You know, and that's what you want. You, you know, so you, you want to knock down these barriers to entry, whether it's uh, a recalcitrant IT person or whether it's uh, a Kaufman landlord or whatever it might be. You know, you just want to make it simple for people to trade with you. And sometimes that's just about having the information and, and uh, that you can tell to a customer. Look, don't worry, read this. 
you can tick that, you can tick that, you can tick that. When do you move, when do you want to start? You know, that's what you want. Um, and that, and that's frankly what I love about it is you're servicing not just co-working spaces, but now you're servicing the spec suites, you're servicing the traditional tenants. It's just easy for once you're wired in a building to to plug and play, and it it does away with that time, right? In a world where, you know, we we've got a flight to quality, right? And and the fact that we flex is is everything, right? Is a lot of these groups are looking for it for exactly those things and the flexibility. I mean another big flight, thing a flight is, I like that flight to quality. Can yeah. I can I can I use that? Absolutely. I, t- <laughs> I stole it from someone else. Um, but Every, I mean the reality is stolen, we we live in a world and obviously you're from the other side of the pond, right? And you lived here in the US. And I think you basically touched on this a bit before we yeah. started recording. But you know, here in the US, we COVID was a great thing because it proved that we could work remotely um and we could have a quality of life right and so i think that is a big shift and change that we're seeing here in the us is you know before we used to live to work right and that was including the the hour two hour commute each way and everything else now people are trying to to be closer to home and focused on having that ability to 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 really enjoy that life uh we we briefly touched on this too before, but I mean, you, you had a, a health scare about a year ago, um, which obviously changed your life completely, right? And yeah. you had to look at things differently. You had to make transitions. I mean, so using everything that, that we've talked about and what we're, who you're trying to service, I mean, what, what are the things that you're grateful for today and the things that, that matter more today than they did before? <laughs> well, well, um, so, uh, so I, yeah, I had a stroke almost a year ago uh, t- t- today. And actually, um, you know, I'm 56 years old, so I didn't expect that kind of thing to happen t- to me. Um, and I recall, t- to your point, I recall uh, when it happened, lying on my kitchen floor, and I knew exactly what had happened. And I lay on my kitchen floor, and I was looking at the undersides of all of our, you know, kitchen units and uh, the chairs. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, it all rushed through my mind of, you know, where we'd bought them and how much we paid for them and all the effort we'd gone into them and, you know, thinking we'd be hosting these amazing dinner parties and people would be coming to our house and it'd be lovely. And, and I just, I kind of was, I laughed at myself for being so stupid and so material and, you know, because it just all was just completely pointless. And, and I would have thrown everything away in a heartbeat to become healthy again, you know, and, that, and, and I, cause I realized immediately this was serious and, you know, the fact that I couldn't speak and couldn't move was 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 clearly uh, a, you know a, a worrying and, and burdensome moment for me. And so, um, yeah, you, you're you're what I have to fight for, Giovanni, is to is to actually take my mind back regularly to that point. Uh, you know, my my recovery has been so uh, so good, and um, and I feel you know absolutely fantastic, and so you know, I've, it's been a been a complete and an amazing recovery. So um, don't worry out there, anyone listening, I'm I'm fine. Um, but the problem is, you become too fine, and you and you slot back into your kind of old ways again. Um, and so for for four months, pretty well, all I did was kind of selfishly look after me. I walked the dog. Uh, I didn't look at any emails. I um, I jumped on my uh, my peloton. Uh, my favorite New York instructor, Jess, who's just had a baby. Congratulations, Jess. Uh, you know, I became at one with the whole, uh, didn't drink any alcohol, uh, didn't uh, eat any cheese. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is kind of like my own patented diet, the no, no beer, no cheese diet. And, uh, but then as soon as you get back to work again, you know, pizzas and, uh, you know, the occasional beer and you haven't got time to exercise so much and, and, um, and the, you know the weight goes back on again. You think, oh, it's fine. I'll do it again next week. And and then suddenly the stress levels go up again, and you're you just find yourself you know not perhaps not sleeping as well. And and then before you know, there you go. So it is important to 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 grab every day. And, and this is awful truism, but you know every day is a blessing. Of course, I spoke to these. Sorry if I'm rabbiting, but when I saw these. Um, these the high school kids uh, 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 earlier before the podcast started and um, you know we introduced them to the building and they just sat there all of them so you know you're 17 18 years old like right at the beginning of it all and I said look today's a day out of the classroom you know you're out of the classroom 
you're doing something different. You've just got to seize it, you know, get as much as you can from this. It's an experience. You've got to live it, you know, put your phones away. Don't, don't live life on the screen. And, uh, and I'm telling my kids that they're the same, you know, they're not listening to me, but I do try to tell them this all the time, that, you know, there's a, there's a life beyond TikTok. There's a life beyond email. There's a life beyond messaging. And, and so the things that I've tried to do, it's a long answer, I'm sorry. But the, so the things I've tried to do, so for example, when I'm in the office, and the, the we, we're normally in three days a week, I do not, I try not to open my laptop. You know, I try not to, I just to use the day to talk to people and and make that my absolute goal. And then I catch up on everything on Mondays and Fridays, you know, at home. But if you're in the office, then the whole point of being there is to collaborate, right? And and to find out how people are and to talk to them. And and if you don't do that, I, you know, people are still slacking each other in the office. Well, has to stop and so i i think so i think i get better quality time in the office now than i did pre-covid pre-stroke if you know what i mean you know, it's all about engagement with people um people and also i have my view of people is is very positive giovanni you know i, I yeah. you know i i think i think people are the most underrated asset that any organization has and Absolutely. they and they can and they can always deliver you know much more for you and they can always do it in a way that they can get more satisfaction and enjoyment from as well and so making sure that your kind of human capital is is not wasted in there and they're enjoying what they're doing and they feel motivated and they know what they're doing then also they know the why they know what it is about they're doing that's important to the company and how it fits in the overall thing so you know we've taken a lot of time right that's kind of what that's where my focus is now which perhaps it wouldn't have been before so you know i want i also want people to live so we, we, we just actually gave everyone a health check the other day back in the office in London and uh, they volunteered for that. And we found a couple of people that need to, you know, a few signs there, you know, I take my blood pressure every day. Do you, uh, do, you do that, Jamie? I, get, I bet you're pretty, you're so healthy, Jamie, that uh, you don't have to I know, but that. I would, I would have thought of you as being so healthy also. You never know. I was, yeah. Yep. I, and that's why, but um, interesting enough, actually, the, uh, this blood pressure, and I'm just going to touch on this because it's important, is what well, is the silent killer, you know. And so if you are not taking your blood pressure regularly, if you're over 40 and mm. you're not taking your blood pressure regularly, that's a bad thing. You should be taking it once, a, you know, once a day is perhaps too much, but once a week, you know, know where it sits. And if it's crept up, then do something about it. Don't be afraid to take the tablets. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Look, this is great. You get a podcast and a health podcast yeah, at the same time. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's that's important, right? The, the, those things all correlate. I mean, so three things I heard you say were, you know, be present, right? Have gratitude and, and complacency. And I think that complacency one is as huge as it applies to our sector and where we are today. And I, I think a good place to kind of finish up is, as we, we came out of the pandemic and as we're coming out of it, right? I think people, landlords, enterprises, just people in general tend to get complacent and, and not remember where we were, right? And what we've overcome and what we've achieved and the value that came back from it. So the challenge is for people to look back and see, you know, where we've come from and and ultimately not want to go back to that, right? Enjoy spending time with your family and your dog and reading your favorite book and exercising <laughs> yeah. and doing all those things. And the same applies for landlords is they got to realize that that's the future, right? That's where we are is how do we create that? Uh, well, that what, audience? what happened to, there was a company, like you may, which major uh, tech company said, actually, everyone's now going to work in the office. Who was that? Can you recall? Was it Google or uh, it was, it was one of the big guys. And I Definitely think it, not Google. But it um, completely, it completely failed, you know, like they, they Yahoo. Oh, Yahoo. Yahoo, who said Yahoo. everybody yeah. has to come to the office. Yeah, yeah they sent oh, everyone yeah. home and then yeah, they yeah. pulled everyone back. Yeah. yeah. But like that, the, 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 the genie is out of that bottle. You know, you can't ever cap that back again. Yeah. Um, but, but, the, but as you, to your point is that if you do go into the office, you know, the whole point of that is, is to make the most of that collaborative time and, and to, to speak to each other. You know, the last thing you want is everyone in back in cubicles in their own offices, uh, just working on stuff and not saying anything to anyone. Um, yeah. So Giovanni, I promise you, when I speak face to face, we'll talk, not email. Absolutely. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so grateful that you took time to, to spend with us. Um, I know it took us a little bit to get it back, but more importantly, we're, we're glad to see your face. We're glad to see you back. I mean, can't wait to, to create more memories and stories of, uh, of phones and pools and rice and, uh, skiing and all kinds of fun stuff like y'all did in the past. 
Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I, I look forward to that too. Um, uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, I, 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 your podcast series is great. Uh, I have to say, uh, podcasts are one of those things that um, y- y- it seems to have crept up on me. It, uh, and there's, we just focus on what we can read, not what we can listen to. And so uh, uh, perhaps I'll become a, a regular subscriber, Jamie. Apologies if I've not been before. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be all yours from now on. Yeah, we've had James has been on the original podcast. That's funny with the dog. If you still walk your dog, I just don't like to. I, I'm always listening to something when I'm walking the dogs. What, what about your dog? Does, doesn't, doesn't your dog want attention from you? Do you? Do you they you don't want to talk to me on the walks. They want to sniff. But you know what dogs do. Oh, oh. I don't know why the sound just came in. Sorry. Uh, we got oh. maybe that's our sign to wrap up. We gotta go. Yeah, yeah, you gotta okay. go. You gotta go back to your high schoolers. <laughs> Yo's got have, a yeah. packed calendar Mock, today. We'll, we mocking, must do this interviews. again. Yeah, listen, we'll do this great. again. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, David. Thank you so much.